Good morning and namaskar. I have a few announcements uh, to make and as I, had, as I had said earlier, the statement is uh, self-explanatory because I am not holding a usual press conference. So I have tried to explain the various points so that the number of questions and clarifications that uh, viewers and all of you would be having in mind, they get uh, sufficiently clarified. I would like to begin with a quote from the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, and I quote, it is when the horizon is the darkest and human reason is bitten down to the ground that faith shines brightest and comes to our rescue. As a nation, we must have faith in India's resilience and capacity to overcome all odds. COVID-19, a virus of the size of 0.12 microns, has crippled the global, global economy with more than 300,000 dead and economic activity across the world stalled. Once again, central banks have to answer the call to the front line in defense of the economy. The recent release of macroeconomic data that for the first time revealed the damage wrought by COVID-19 brought forward the need for an off-cycle meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee, that is the MPC, in lieu of the earlier scheduled meeting uh, between uh, June 3rd to 5th, 2020. Over the last three days, that is 20th, 21st and 22nd, the MPC reviewed the domestic and global developments and their implications for the outlook. After extensive discussions, the MPC voted unanimously for a reduction in policy repo rate and for maintaining the accommodative stance of monetary policy as long as necessary to revive growth and to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 while ensuring that inflation remains within the target. On the quantum of reduction, the MPC voted with a 5 is to 1 majority to reduce the policy repo rate by 40 basis points, 40, 40 basis points from 4.4% to 4%. Consequently, the MSF rate and the bank rate now stand reduced to 4.25% and reverse repo rate stands reduced to 3.35%. Before I lay out the backdrop, the rational and expected outcomes of the MPC's decisions, I wish to thank the committee members for their valuable contribution uh, during the deliberations. I would also like to thank my colleagues in the RBI who have been working tirelessly in RBI's fight against COVID-19. My gratitude goes out to our teams for their intellectual support, analytical work and the logistical arrangements. A special word of praise for our team of what is now about 200 officers, staff and service providers who, has, who are working unstinted 24 into 7 in isolation away from their families in order to keep the essential RBI services available to the nation. Once again, I wish to express our admiration for the doctors, the healthcare and medical staff, police, law enforcement agencies, functionaries and personnel of the government the private sector, banks and other financial institutions who have risen to the occasion day after day through the pandemic to ensure continuity in provision of all essential services. Our deepest gratitude to their families too. I would now like to provide an assessment of the current uh, macroeconomic uh, situation, both global and domestic. By all counts, the macroeconomic and financial conditions are austere. The global economy is inexorably headed into recession. The global manufacturing PMI contracted to an 11-year low in April 2020. The global services PMI recorded its steepest decline in the history of the index. Among advanced economies that have released GDP readings for Q1 of 2020, contractions were in the range of 3.4% to 14.2%. For emerging market economies, the growth rate ranged between 2.9% and minus 6.8%. EMEs face additional pressures in the form of capital outflows and asset price volatility from the bouts of turbulence afflicting financial markets. The plunge in crude prices has dried up budgetary revenues for oil exporters. On the other hand, 
Oil importers have been denied terms of trade gains by the crushing blow to demand delivered by the pandemic. According to the UNCTAD, the value of global trade contracted by 3% in Q1. The volume of world trade can shrink by 13 to 32% in the current year as projected by the WTO. Global financial markets have calmed after a turbulent period in March and volatility has ebbed, but markets have generally been disconnected from the developments in the real economy. Relatively unsung, global policy response by central banks and governments has been unprecedented. Let me now turn to the domestic developments. Domestic economic activity has been impacted severely by the two months lockdown. The top six industrialized states in India that account for 60% of our industrial output are largely, they are largely in the red and orange zones. High frequency indicators point to a collapse in demand beginning in March 2020 across both urban and rural segments. Electricity and petroleum consumption, which are indicators of day-to-day -day demand, have plunged into steep declines. The double whammy of, in terms of losses of both demand and production has in turn taken its toll on fiscal revenues. Investment demand has virtually been halted by a decline of 36% in the production of capital goods in March, which was coincident with a contraction of 27% in imports of capital goods in March and 57.5% in April. This is also evident in a fall of 91% in finished steel consumption in April and 25% shrinkage in cement production during March. The biggest blow from COVID-19 has been to private consumption, which accounts for about 60% of the domestic demand. The production of consumer durables fell by 33% in March 2020, accompanied by a 16% decline in output of non-durables. Similar indications are reflected in surveys of the fast-moving consumer space also. In the production sectors, industrial production shrank by close to 17% in March, with manufacturing activity down by 21%. The output of core industries, which constitutes about 40% of overall industrial production, contracted by 6.5%. In conformity, the manufacturing PMI for April recorded its sharpest deterioration to 27.4, spread across all sectors. All sectors. The services PMI plunged to an all-time low of 5.4% in April 2020. Amidst this encircling gloom, agriculture and allied activities have, however, provided a beacon of hope on the, bank of, on the back of an increase of 3.7% in food grain production to a new record. A ray, a ray of hope also comes from the forecast of normal southwest monsoon by the India Meteorological Department. By 10th May 2020, up to which the latest information is available, Kharif sowing was higher by 44% compared to the last year's acreage. Rabi procurement is in full flow in respect of oil seeds, pulses, wheat, benefiting the bumper harvest. These developments will support farm incomes, improve the terms of trade facing the farm sector and strengthen food security for the country. Going forward, these would also have a salutary effect on food price pressures. The inflation outlook has become complicated by the release of partial information on the consumer price index by National Statistics Organization, obscuring a comprehensive assessment of the price situation. From the incomplete data that have been made available, food inflation, which had eased in January, uh, eased uh, from its uh, January 2020 peak for uh, next uh, two months, that is during February and March. Now suddenly they have reversed and surged to 8.6% in April as supply disruptions took their toll, immune to the ongoing demand compression. Prices of vegetables, pulses, oil seeds, milk and cereals emerged as pressure points. In the external sector, India's merchandise exports and imports suffered their worst slump in the last 30 years as COVID-19 
paralyzed world production and demand. India's merchandise exports plunged by 60.3% in April, while imports contracted by 58.6%. India's foreign exchange reserves have however increased by 9.2 billion during uh, 2021 that is from 1st April onwards and uh, so far that is up to 15th of May uh, our uh, uh, foreign exchange uh, forex reserves they stand at 487 billion US dollars which is equivalent to one year's imports. I now go to the outlook with regard to inflation and growth. Against this backdrop, the MPC assessed that inflation outlook is highly uncertain. The supply shock to food prices in April may show persistence over the next, next few months, depending upon the state of lockdown and the time taken to restore the supply chains after relaxation of the lockdown. Among the pressure points, the elevated level of pulses inflation is worrisome and warrants timely and swift supply side interventions including a reappraisal of the import duties. Immediate step up of open market sales, PDS offtake by FCI to offload some part of excess stocks can also cool down cereal prices and also create room for rubby procurement. Given the current global demand supply balance, international crude oil prices, metals, and industrial raw materials are likely to remain soft. This would ease input costs for domestic firms. Deficient demand may hold down pressure on core inflation, although persisting supply dislocations impart uncertainty to their near-term outlook. Much will depend on the shape of the recovery after COVID-19. Accordingly, the MPC is of the view that headline inflation may remain firm in the first half of 2020, but should ease in the second half, aided also by favorable base effects. By Q3 and Q4 of the current financial year, it is expected, to fall, it is expected that the headline inflation will fall below the target of 4%. Thus, the MPC's forward guidance on inflation is directional rather than in terms of levels. Going forward, as and when more data are available, it should be possible to estimate the path of inflation with greater certainty. It is in the growth outlook that MPC judged the risks to be the gravest. The, the combined impact of demand compression and supply disruption will depress economic activity in the first half of the year. Assuming that economic activity gets restored in a phased manner, especially in the second half of this year, and taking into consideration favorable base effects, it is expected that the combination of fiscal, monetary, and administrative measures being currently undertaken, both by the government and the RBI, would create conditions for a gradual revive, revival in activity in the second half of 2021. Nonetheless, downside risks to this assessment are significant and contingent upon the containment of the pandemic and quick phasing out of social distancing and lockdowns. Given all these uncertainties, GDP growth in 2021 is estimated to remain in the negative territory, with some pickup in growth impulses in H2 2021 onwards. The end May 2020 release of NSO on national income should provide greater clarity, enabling more specific projections of GDP growth in terms of both magnitude and direction. Much will depend on how quickly the COVID curve flattens and begins to moderate. As the nation prepares for this future, the words of Mahatma Gandhi should inspire us to fight on. I quote, we may stumble and fall, but shall rise again, unquote. The MPC is of the view that the macroeconomic impact of the pandemic is turning out to be more severe than initially anticipated. Beyond the destruction of economic and financial activity, livelihood and health are severely affected. Judging that the risks to growth are acute, while the risks to inflation are likely to be short-lived, the MPC believes that it is essential now to instill confidence and ease financial conditions further. This will facilitate 
flow of funds at affordable rates and rekindle investment impulses. It is in this context that the MPC voted to reduce the policy, reverse, the policy repo rate by 40 basis points from 4.4 to 4 percent. If the inflation trajectory evolves as expected, more space will open up to address the risks to growth. Now I now turn to some regulatory and development uh, policy announcements. The regulatory and developmental measures which we announced today, they are being done to complement and amplify the reduction in the policy repo rate decided by the MPC. As I have said earlier, the RBI has been constantly monitoring the situation. We are extremely uh, careful and uh, very, uh, you know, it, uh, the, uh, at the level of the level of vigilance is at its highest, is at its peak in RBI. My, our entire team of officers are closely monitoring the developments in various segments of the economy and you would have seen that over the past uh, two or three months as and when it was warranted, the RBI has not waited for a formal statement to be made by the governor but we have been taking policy measures and as and when, uh, you know, as and when the situation warrants to the best of our ability, we are reacting to situations, we are trying to anticipate and also trying to be proactive and that shall continue to be under the underlying theme of our approach. In my statement at the time of MPC meeting in February 2020, I had pointed out the increasing downside risks to global growth in the context of the outbreak of coronavirus, the full effects of which were still un uncertain and unfolding at that time, that is in the first week of February. Since then, RBI has proactively managed liquidity conditions, expanding its array of measures, both conventional and unconventional. In the meantime, the monetary policy transmission to banks' lending rates has also continued to improve significantly. I have some details about the transmission of policy rates in, in the various segments of the uh, financial markets. I have also data about the transmission of the policy rate to the new fresh loans being sanctioned by the banks. I am not reading them out. They are content in my statement. Those who are interested may please have a look at the statement which will be uploaded immediately after uh, my this statement uh, on the television and in the YouTube is over. The decision of the MPC to reduce the policy repo rate and maintain the accommodative stance of monetary policy provides the opportunity for the RBI to announce certain additional measures against the backdrop of a deteriorating outlook for economic activity. These policy actions complement and strengthen each other in intent and reach. The measures being announced today can broadly be delineated under four categories. One, measures to improve the functioning of markets and market participants. Two, measures to support exports and imports. Three, efforts to further ease financial stress caused by COVID-19 disruptions by providing relief on debt servicing and improving access to working capital. And four, steps to ease financial constraints faced by the state governments. I first take up measures to improve the functioning of markets. The RBI had earlier announced a special refinance facility of 15,000 crore to SIDBI at RBI's policy repo rate for a period of 90 days for, its, for the lending and refinancing operations of uh, the SIDBI. In order to provide greater flexibility to SIDBI, it has been decided to roll over the facility at the end of the 90th day for another 90 days. The next point relates to investments by the foreign portfolio investors, that is FPIs under the voluntary retention route of the RBI. Since its introduction, the voluntary retention route scheme has evinced strong investor participation with investments exceeding 90% of the limits allotted under the scheme. In view of the difficulties expressed by FPIs and their custodians on account of COVID-19 related disruptions in adhering to the condition that at least 75% of allotted limits be invested within three months. It has been decided that an additional three months time will be allowed to FPIs to fulfill this requirement. The next set of measures relate to our effort to support exports and 
imports. The deepening of the contraction in global activity and trade accentuated by rapid spread of COVID-19 has crippled external demand. In turn, this has impacted India's exports and imports, both of which have contracted sharply in the recent months. In view of the importance of exports and imports to the economy, certain measures are being taken to support the foreign trade sector. The first measure relates to export credit. In order to alleviate genuine difficulties being faced by exporters in their production and realization cycles, it has been decided to increase the maximum permissible period of pre-shipment and post-shipment export credit sanctioned by the banks from the existing one year to 15 months for disbursements made up to July 31st, 2020. Sec the next measure relates to liquidity facility for the Exim Bank of India. In order to enable the Exim Bank to meet its foreign currency resource requirements, it has been decided to extend a line of credit of rupees 15,000 crore to the Exim Bank for a period of 90 days with rollover of up to one year so as to enable it to avail a US dollar swap facility. Next measure relates to extension of time for payment for imports. With a view to providing greater flexibility to importers in managing their operating cycle in a COVID-19 environment, it has been decided to extend the time period for completion of outward remittances against normal imports, that is excluding import of gold, diamonds and precious stones and jewelry into India from six months to 12 months from the date of shipment of such imports made on or before July 31st, 2020. The next set of measures relate to measures to uh, ease the financial stress. The RBI had earlier on two separate occasions on March 27th and on Ap uh, April 17th when I made uh, statements uh, in the media. Uh, the RBI had announced uh, you know, on both these occasions uh, certain regulatory measures pertaining to granting of three months moratorium on term loan installments. That is the first one we had announced. Two, deferment of interest for three months on working capital facilities. Three, easing of working capital financing requirements by reducing margins or reassessment of working capital cycle. Three, exemption from being classified as defaulter in supervisory reporting and reporting to credit information companies. Five, I think one, two, three, four, five, I'm just listing out, it's possible that it missed to, you know, that exemption probably was number five, ex exemption from being classified as defaulter. I think that was four. The fifth point is extension of resolution timelines for stressed assets. And the sixth point was asset classification standstill by excluding the moratorium period of three months. So all these measures we have announced on uh, 27th of March and on April uh, uh, 17th, essentially arising from you know this three months time we gave uh, three months moratorium we allowed on the term loans, then on working capital we allowed certain relaxations and associated measures. In view of the extension of the lockdown and continuing disruptions on account of COVID-19, the above measures are being further extended by another three months from 1st June till 31st August, taking the total period of applicability of the measures to six months, that is from 1st March to 31st August 2020. The lending institutions are being permitted to restore the margins. You know, this is another announcement which I would like uh, to draw your attention to. The lending institutions are being permitted, I mean, not only with regard to uh, working capital, we are extending the time limit uh, by another three months, but the lending institutions are being permitted to restore the margins for working capital to their original levels by 31st March 2020. This is one area where we had given three months time now. We are now giving time uh, that the, you know, the uh, uh, margins which the reduced margins, you know, that will be restored by 31st March, which will make it easier for borrowers to sort of uh, manage their finances, manage their cash flow in a gradual manner. Similarly, 
the measures pertaining to reassessment of working capital cycle are being extended up to 31st March 2021. Additionally, it has been decided to permit lending institutions to convert the accumulated interest on working capital facilities over the total deferment period of six months, that is from 1st March to 31st August, into a funded interest term loan, which shall be fully repaid during the course of the current financial year ending 31st March 2021. Now, this is one area where we had received a lot of representations, not only from banks, but also from the real sector borrowers. They were saying that the earlier deferment of interest which RBI had permitted, that meant that the entire interest component, the entire interest accumulate, the entire accumulated interest during the three months moratorium had to be sort of paid back to the bank in one shot. Obviously, it was posing problems in cash flow management for the various uh, borrowers, for the various borrowing entities. So taking this into account, we have now decided that it will be converted into, you know, the uh, deferment of the working capital during the six months period. They will be converted into a funded interest term loan, which will be fully repaid during the course of the current year, that is during the next few months, and the payment shall be completed by 31st March. This will provide considerable amount of ease and this will facilitate easier cash flow management by the borrowing entities. In view of the current difficulty in raising resources from capital markets, the group exposure limit of banks is being increased from 25% to 30% of eligible capital base for enabling the corporates to meet their funding requirement from banks. The increased limit will be applicable up to June 30th, 2021. The last set of measures, they relate to easing the financial constraints faced by the state government and there is one announcement. Uh, in order to ease the uh, bond redemption pressure on the states, uh, it has been decided to relax the rules governing the withdrawal from the consolidated sinking fund, that is CSF, uh, while at the same time ensuring that depletion of fund balance is done prudently. Together with the normally permissible withdrawal, this measure will enable the states to meet about 45% of the redemptions of their market borrowings, which are due in the current year 2021. Detailed guidelines for all the above announcements will be issued uh, separately. I now come to my concluding remarks. Uh, I would like to say that uh, central banks are typically seen as conservative institutions, yet when the tide turns and all the chips are down, it is to the central banks that the world turns for support. And this is all over the world, almost in every country. And this is visible in the action being taken by the various central banks across the world. And you would have noticed in India also the RBI is trying to take necessary measures. And we are, whatever maximum measures we are able to undertake, the RBI is at the forefront and is taking the measures going forward as I have said, we will continue to be vigilant and we will take whatever measures are necessary to meet the COVID-related challenges which are ahead of us. As I have stated earlier, the RBI will continue to remain vigilant and in battle readiness to use all its instruments and even fashion new ones as recent experience has demonstrated to address the dynamics of the unknown future. The goal, as I have enunciated earlier, are Number one, to keep the financial system and financial markets sound, liquid, and smoothly functioning. Number two, to ensure access to finance to all, especially those that tend to get excluded by the financial markets. And three, and very important, to preserve financial stability. It shall be our endeavor that RBI's actions and stance contribute to laying the foundations for a better tomorrow in India. Today's trials may be traumatic, but together we shall triumph. I would like to conclude on this optimistic note. Thank you very much for your patience.